on the Lord's Day and uh, a very, very warm welcome to everyone here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord who entered Jerusalem, uh, the Lord who was crucified five days later and then the following Sunday rose to life again. Uh, welcome. My name's Paul Hewlett. I'm the pastor here at uh, Grove Chapel. It's, uh, it's good to welcome uh, some visitors and one or two new faces. If it's your first time in Grove, you are extremely welcome. We're glad to have you with us. And an especial welcome to our visiting preacher today and his family. So Gordon and Sandra and Joel and Rachel, uh, you are welcome back to Grove Chapel. I know you've been here before at least three times in, in, uh, in my recollection, maybe more than that. And they've driven down today from, from Warboys. I know Warboys very well. We were talking before about the mountain ranges of Cambridgeshire. Um, Warboys is in the high peaks of Cambridgeshire, all of 35 feet above sea level, something like that. Um, anyway, welcome, welcome from there. And um, as you'll hear later on, we are having a lunch today. There is a, a fellowship lunch, a bring and share lunch. The tables are set in the back hall and uh, all are welcome to, to partake of the food, and Gordon will then be sharing uh, rather more about his and Sandra's work and calling after lunch. So uh, that's what's happening today. Of course, we meet again this evening. I don't want to take all of the notices away from, uh, from Peter. So. Um, anyway, let's begin with some words from Psalm 68 as a call to worship, for we are called by the Lord to worship him. Blessed be the Lord, who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. Well, I'm sure we notice there the, uh, the, the prominence of the word salvation and that great declaration. God is our salvation. We all need to be saved from every enemy we have, from sin and from death and from the wrath of God and from the judgment of God, from the guilt and pollution of sin. God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, he is our salvation. And let's come now in prayer and worship. Let us pray. We praise you, Father, Son, and Spirit, glorious in majesty, eternal and infinite in being, wise and powerful and good in character, merciful and gracious and loving in saving a humble people who cry out to you day and night in the name of the Son of your love, our Lord Jesus, whom you sent into this world. O oh Lord, we pray that today, as we meet, as we remember again that many have already met and many will meet later in the day across this world, Lord, in a world of such turmoil, in a nation of mounting turmoil in many ways, and O oh Lord, with perhaps the turmoil of our own lives thrown into all of that, we come to you, in whom there is no turmoil, but there is peace, there is security. We find indeed salvation, we find a home, we find a father, far greater than any earthly father. We find a friend, oh such a friend, who loved us before we ever knew him. And we pray, O oh Lord, that for all of us today, we would know you, meet with you, and you would do great things in our gathering now. We come and pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing God's praises. Our first hymn uh, is uh, from a psalm based on one of the psalms. Sing to God new songs of worship. All his deeds are marvelous. He has brought salvation to us with his hand and holy arm. Let's stand and sing together.
is going to come and bring the notices to us. Thank you and good morning. Welcome to our services at Grove Chapel today. And this morning, our preacher is Gordon Bull. A warm welcome to you and to your family. And may God bless your ministry to us this morning. Uh, there's a staff crest during this service. If you wish to use this, then please feel free to take your children to the rear of the, of the church during the third hymn. After this service is Sunday school, and this is followed by our bring and share lunch, and everyone is welcome to that. Um, and after lunch, Gordon will talk more about his, his current ministry to us all. Uh, this evening at 6.30, David Hendricks will be preaching God's word to us. On Wednesday morning, little fishers meet at 10 o'clock, and we meet for prayer uh, at 8, at 8 o'clock in the rear hall. Friday is Good Friday, and there is a joint service at Honor Oak Christian Fellowship, and that's at 10.30, and I believe Paul is preaching. Paul's preaching at that service. Uh, next week, Sunday, we meet here again at 10.30 and 6.30, and I believe there's no Sunday school next week as it's start of school holidays. Uh, on Thursday, the 25th of April, is our annual church meeting. Uh, this will be at 8 o'clock, and those who are responsible for reports, if you could give those to Paul by the 6th of April. And finally, don't forget, next Sunday, the clocks go forward one hour, so don't miss that one. Thank you. Indeed, the clocks go forward an hour, so it'll, it'll feel like starting at half past nine. It'll feel really, really early in the morning, okay? So don't be late to bed on Saturday night. Um, yes, Wednesday, Little Fishes, and I'll be doing a, a short talk there for, for the adults, for the, for the parents and carers, um, in advance of our Easter services next Sunday. Just to say, we'll be giving these out there, uh, this is a little postcard that David's produced for us. The resurrection, true and beautiful. And there's something. What is both true and beautiful at the same time? Not many things are, but the Lord Jesus and his resurrection and the whole gospel undoubtedly is. Um, there's a number of these also in the vestibule. If you want to take one or two for, for neighbors, for friends, for family, for colleagues, please do that. And, uh, and uh, also, of course, Wednesday there'll be a few for for folk then. Um, yes, so Good Friday, Honor Oak, and I will be just putting on the, on the church WhatsApp exactly where that is in case people aren't sure of the location. It is um, very much in the center of Honor Oak. Um, and I think that's all that we need to say. So um, I'm going to go and sit down, and um, as Gordon comes up for the children's talk, could the children come to the front as they normally do, please? Good morning. How are you all today? You good? You fine? You wonderful? This time next week, will you have eaten your body weight in chocolate? You're not going to get any chocolate eggs at Christmas time? I mean, Christmas, Christmas. You can have chocolate eggs at Christmas time, by all means, but I prefer them at Easter time. Now, I want to ask you a question. I really, really, really want to go to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Yeah? It's a, that's a nice place, isn't it? Lots of nice things in heaven, some nice people in heaven. But you know, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get there. I think, you know, like most things, if you want to go to a special place, what do you have to do? You have to buy a ticket, don't you? So I think I'm going to buy a ticket. Oh, I don't know how much it costs, a ticket to heaven. Let's see what I've got in my pocket. I've got a nectar card. Do you think that'll help me? Do you think that'll buy me a ticket to heaven? How many nectar points do I need to get into heaven? Do you think that'll work? You know what? I have 
like one of the most valuable things in London, and all zones, train ticket, I mean, that is worth a lot of money now. Maybe, do you think that'll work? Do you think if there's one of those gates at heaven, I can put that in and it'll open? No? All right, what else have I got here? Oh, who likes castles? Anybody like castles? You like castles? I have an annual pass to Beaver Castle. It's not spelled like Beaver. This English language is so funny. But anyway, I have a pass to Beaver Castle. Do you think, do you think I could use that? I mean, heaven's a castle, isn't it? I could just give, here's my pass. What, what if I use my bank card? Do you think that'll help me? No. Let's see. Do I, I wonder if I have anything else in my pocket. Hmm. Oh, wait. Oh. Whoa. What's that? Maybe what, what, what does that say on it? It says one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars. I mean, do you, I mean, oh, come on. I mean, I could buy like, I could buy like Australia and I could give that to God. And I say, if, if I give you Australia, would you let me into heaven? Do you think that'll get me into heaven? Not even $100 trillion. Oh, you are tough. You are tough. Why, why won't that get me into heaven? Is it not enough? Do I need some more? Why do you? I can't. I can't buy my. Not even one hundred trillion dollars. No. Oh boy. Hmm. Well, now I'm really stuck because I mean, if one hundred trillion dollars doesn't get me into heaven, I'm in big trouble, aren't I? But you're 100% right. You know, the Bible tells us, Psalm chapter 49 and verse 7, it says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. So no one can actually pay their way into heaven. Why not? What's one of the most famous verses in the Bible? I bet you if I start it, you'll be able to remember it. It starts with the word for... The wages, does anybody know the rest of it? For the wages of sin is death. Wow, that's, that's quite a big price, isn't it? Our sins, as a result of our sins, means that we're going to die, and, and then we face the judgment of God, and we can't go to heaven. Not even a hundred trillion dollars will help us. So what do we do? Well, can you remember what the second half of the verse says? Any of you remember the second half? Should we ask the grown-ups for some help? Do any of the grown-ups know what the second half of the verse is? For the wages of sin is death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You omitted the important part there. So the wages of sin is death, and it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter if you have a nectar card or a bank card or a train card or a hundred trillion dollars. None of that's going to be able to pay for your sins. But God gives us a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we get to celebrate that next week, don't we, with Easter time. Remembering all that Jesus did to save us from our sins that he might give us the gift of eternal life. And you know what? As you grow up, lots of people are going to tell you, oh, you need this thing and you need this thing and you need this thing. And if you want to have a really happy and wonderful life, you've got to have that and that and that. But you know what? The Bible tells us right from the beginning, the thing that we need the most, the thing that we need to give us eternal life is we need Jesus Christ. And he is better than a hundred trillion dollars believe it or not, because only he can take away our sins and only he can give us eternal life. So I want to leave you with a question to think about. Have you trusted in Jesus to give you eternal life? And if you want to know how you can do that, I'm sure that you can speak to Pastor Paul or to Pastor David or to any of your Sunday school teachers and they can tell you more about how you can get that free gift. Shall we pray together? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you don't ask us to pay for our sins. You don't make us have to work for your forgiveness. Instead, you give it to us as a free, undeserved gift through that which Jesus did for us on the cross and by rising again from the dead. And thank you that if we ask you for this gift, trusting that Jesus can pay for our sins, you will give it to us. And we will not only have the joy of knowing you in this life, but also the joy of knowing that one day we will be with you in your perfect kingdom. Help us to understand this and to believe this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening so well. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you so much for that so clear uh, gospel presentation. We're going to sing now about how uh, how we gain heaven, how we gain salvation. Uh, it's through the Lord Jesus who was led like a lamb to the slaughter in silence and shame. There on your back you carried a world of violence and pain. Let's all declare together the gospel as we, as we sing it uh, and stand together.
David's going to come and uh, read God's word to us. Our reading today comes from uh, the end of Isaiah 52 and all the way through Isaiah 53, page 742. Okay, hear then God's word to us. From verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they will see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should behold him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Thanks be to God for his words to us.
thanks indeed. Let's all pray together. He makes intercession for the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. We come, O oh Lord, as sinners. We come, Lord, with no righteousness to plead, with no accomplishments to speak of, whether it would be money or tickets or merit or worth or anything at all. It is all nothing in your sight that can ever bring us any nearer to you. It is your mercy alone, O Lord, that inclined you to look on a world full of sinners who had turned away from you. Our hearts do not naturally incline to you, but they incline instead to self and to sin and to every wrong and false and crooked way. But, O oh Lord, in your triune majesty and glory and purpose, the Father who loves us and the Son who came and died and rose again and the Spirit who comes to apply the gospel O oh Lord, apply that gospel here today. Apply gospel power through the ministry of your servant, Gordon. We thank you for him being here. We pray you would anoint his lips and make him to be a very ambassador from heaven to everyone who is here today. Lord, we come confessing our sin before you. We have stepped way wide of the mark even today. We have sinned with our minds. We have sinned with our tongues. We have sinned with our hands, with our feet. Uh, we have sinned in our imaginations. We have sinned through foolishness and thoughtlessness. We have sinned, O oh Lord, through lack of love and lack of faith. But, O oh Lord, there is no sin so great that you cannot pardon it. We remember, O oh Lord, as often we do this time of year, there was a man on the cross next to the Lord Jesus whose sins were so very great. But in those dying hours of his life, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus remembered him and announced that that very day he would be in the paradise of God. And may we know that today in mighty power. Lord, how the world needs this gospel salvation. We pray for the preaching of the gospel, for the gossiping of the gospel, for the living out of the gospel. From every, in every nation, in every continent, Lord, in, in Europe and in Asia, in Australasia, in North and South America, in Africa, O oh Lord, in every island across the oceans, may the name of Jesus, the only name of Jesus, who is that gift of God, who is our salvation, be sounded here and everywhere. Lord, we come. And we pray that this would be true here today. We uh, ask all these things. We pray that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing again our third hymn now. Again, it speaks of the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation, um, but also of the victory, of course. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's stand and sing.
before uh, our brother Gordon comes to preach, we're going to read God's Word again, a second reading. We're going to read the whole of Mark chapter 5, page 1013. Mark chapter 5. Let's hear this dramatic narrative from the very heart of the ministry of the Lord Jesus in Galilee. Much of the events of Jesus' miraculous works are recorded in this passage, Matthew, uh, Mark, Mark chapter 5, from the beginning. They've just, Jesus and the disciples have just uh, crossed the uh, Sea of Galilee and the storm has been stilled. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, <clears throat> and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he, that is Jesus, was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him, that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away, and began to pro proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately 
the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise and immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat the lord this is his word. May he add his blessing now to the preaching of the word, to the hearing of the word. May we hear as hearing the very voice of the Son of God and live. Gordon, I invite you to come and bring God's word to us. Shall we pray together? Our great God, you are aware that all of us have had a busy week. Most of us are going into a busy week. And when we sit down and have time to sort of sit and relax a bit, all the thoughts of the previous week and the coming week come flooding to mind. Therefore, at times like this, we, we find it so easily to become distracted, to start thinking about what we should have done and, and what we need to do and deadlines and demands. But Father, may we perceive that now is a precious time for us because we get to open your word that comes with your voice and your authority, that comes to us by your spirit. And you desire now to speak to us through it and by it. And Father, this should be to us the most precious of times. And so we ask that you would equip us by means of your spirit so that we may be able to fix our minds on your word and to allow you to speak to us. Putting aside any uh, objections we might raise or any areas in which we might harden our hearts. May, may we open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears so that we may freely hear from you. And so, Father, we ask now that you would speak to us and that we would respond with faithful and willing obedience. For we ask this all in Christ's precious name. Well, in case you did not know, 
It's Easter next weekend. And for most of us, Easter is one of those uh, times of year that sort of sneaks up on us and catches us by surprise, mainly because it's never on the same date. And so we always find ourselves sort of flipping through the calendar to think, well, when is Easter uh, this year? But, but also because the, the new year starts with so many busy things that, that need to be done that we, we very quickly find ourselves arriving at Easter and almost having had no time to really give any thought to what it is that we are celebrating, that we are remembering at Easter time. The reality is that uh, Easter, the, the, the cross, the resurrection, the work of Christ uh, on that uh, uh, time should, should be the, uh, the lens through which we, we look at everything in the world, that the way that we, we think about life and, and how we make our decisions. Nothing and no one has changed the world more than what Christ did on that very first Easter weekend. It is the, not just the high point of human history, it's also the turning point of human history and eternity because it is the event by which all of humanity will be judged. Every single person death will stand before the judgment seat of God and will be judged according to how they responded to the events of Easter time. It is that important. And so in many respects, it's sad that we don't prepare ourselves adequately to, to celebrate this Easter weekend. And so I, I want us this morning to start that Easter preparation process as we look forward to next weekend by looking at the trio of miracles that Mark records for us in Mark chapter 5 because they serve to point us to what it is that Christ will accomplish by virtue of His death and His resurrection. So please do have your Bibles open at Mark chapter 5 and we will work our way through this chapter together this morning. We start at the beginning with the first miracle, this demon-possessed man. And Mark paints a graphic picture for us. I wonder if Mark was a bit of an artist. Uh, he loves painting very colorful and graphic and descriptive uh, pictures for us, and he builds them in, in levels. And he tells us that as Jesus arrives at the, the shoreline, as he steps out of the boat, there is this man that comes rushing towards Jesus. A man who's filled with an unclean spirit. And this man, is, as Mark describes him to us, he, he draws a picture of us of a man who is truly tormented. He is bloodied, he is scarred, he is wounded. He is dirty, very possibly naked. The people in the village nearby had, had become familiar with his cries of distress and torment. We're told he cried out day and night. He was beyond all hope. Mark tells us every effort to restrain him had failed. And so as a last resort, they drove him out of their city, out of their town to a place of death, to the tombs, to the, to the graveyard, to a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a place where the, 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 the curse of death hangs heavy, a place where there is no hope to be found. And there he is abandoned, forsaken, left essentially to die. I cannot begin to Understand how distressing it must have been for this man. We're told that he, he cut himself with stones, almost as a, I guess as a desperate attempt to try and get rid of this evil spirit. And then, of course, we, we read that now even his voice is not his own. Before he is able to speak to Jesus, this spirit cries out in defiance, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. 
There's a rich irony to that, isn't there? Because this spirit is quite happy to torment this man, but does not want to be tormented. The statement is as telling as it is ironic because the spirits know exactly who Jesus is. They know what happens when they, as evil spirits, encounter the presence of a holy, all-powerful God. They know very well who is the ultimate power in this situation. Now, this is a bit of an interesting account in in the Gospels because this is essentially the only time in the Gospels that we have Jesus sort of interacting or interrogating with the Spirit. Normally, He drives them out before they are even able to say much. But here, he, He interrogates the Spirit. He asks the Spirit its name, and the Spirit replies, its name is Legion because it is more than just one Spirit but many. And and that there is implying that that the demonic spirits that are in this man are powerful. They have, as it were, the power and the strength of a a legion of men. And and therefore, this this poor demon-possessed man, he stands no hope against this demonic force. There is absolutely nothing he can do to set himself free from this evil presence. This evil will devour and destroy him. It is well and truly beyond his ability to break free from. And yet now, as we know so well, for this man, hope has come because Christ has come. And in an instant, he is set free from these demonic spirits. Jesus drives them out. The the spirits are cast into a herd of pigs. And and even there, you see the destructive intent of this demonic force as they destroy that entire herd of pigs. But then Mark focuses our attention back in on this demon-possessed man, this formerly demon-possessed man. And and it's a vastly different picture. No longer do do we have this man looking all distressed and tormented. No, Mark tells us, There he was, sitting, clothed, in his right mind. And it appears that this man uh, had some understanding of who Jesus was. As a result of what had happened to him, this man, Mark tells us, desires to follow Jesus, but Jesus says, no, go back. Go back to your friends, go back to your families, go back to the community, the very community that drove you out. And tell them what the Lord has done, how He has had mercy on you, which He does. It is an utterly remarkable transformation. And this so clearly points us to Easter. So clearly points us to the crucifixion and to the resurrection in a number of ways. Firstly, with regards to us. We are that demon-possessed man, as much as we may not like to admit to that, but we are like him. Paul tells us that prior to Christ, we followed the course of this world, Ephesians 2, 2, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. John tells us even more starkly, 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, that those who sin are of the devil that through our sin we give evidence of the fact that we are children of the devil. Jesus himself tells in John 8 that that those who do not accept his testimony, those who do not uh, accept his word and believe in him, prove that they are of their father, the devil. The reality is such is the hold of sin and evil and the evil one upon us, There is nothing that you and I can do that will be able to set ourselves free from it. We are as hopeless as that demon-possessed man was, unable to break free from that hold. We need divine intervention. We need what this man needs, and that is Jesus, to come and to set us free from the hold, the authority, and the power of sin evil and the evil one. 
And the wonderful news is that this is part of the purpose for which Christ came. John tells us in that same passage from 1 John chapter 3, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Paul tells us in Colossians 2.15 that at the cross, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. But how does Jesus do that? Well, Jesus does that by becoming in many respects like that demon-possessed man. Think back to that passage that was read earlier for us from Isaiah chapter 52. How was, how was Jesus described? Marred beyond all human semblance, bloodied and bruised, beaten, scourged, flogged, mutilated, stripped naked. And then what happens? He is driven out of the city to a place of certain death, to the place of crucifixion, where you hear the tormenting cries of dying men, a place where there is the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Jesus becomes like that demon-possessed man with the very important distinction that he is not under the power or the influence, or the hold, or the authority of the evil one, or sin, or evil. Rather, Jesus willingly endures all of this. He goes as the, the all-powerful God the Son in meekness. Isaiah tells us, like a lamb led to the slaughter, Jesus goes to the cross. And then when that blessed resurrection day comes, when, when Christ rises from the dead in victory, what is happening in that moment? Well, in that moment, the power of sin, the power of evil, the, the power of the evil one is broken and defeated once and for all. For all those who believe, He offers them that same victory, that same sin-breaking, sin-defeating victory. He offers to them that same liberation from the hold of evil and the evil one. Paul in Colossians 1, Peter in 1 Peter 2, tells us that, that Christ is able to transfer us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His marvelous light. Christ at the cross, Christ through His resurrection, defeats once and for all the power, the hold, the authority of sin, evil, and the evil one. And for those who trust in Him, He gives them that same victory. And they become no longer children of the devil, but children of God, who are able to say, look and see what the Lord has done for me. He sets us free sin, evil, and the evil one at the cross. Mark then records a second miracle for us in verses 25 through 34. And again, he paints another vivid picture for us of this woman. We're told that this woman is suffering from what would have been regarded as an exceptionally shameful condition. We're told that she's suffering greatly. She had sought the help, Mark tells us, of many physicians to help and cure her from her condition. And, and it had come at great financial cost to the point that she had now actually reached the end of her financial resources. So not only is she suffering, but she is now in poverty. And, and Mark then builds even more. He says, tragically, for this poor woman, her situation had not improved. Her suffering had only increased. And as dire as her physical state is, there is another aspect to it that would have made it even more unbearable for her. According to the law of Moses, Leviticus 15, 19 through 30, she was regarded as unclean. 
along with everything and everyone that she touched. She could not be a part of normal family life. Life had to be lived avoiding her, avoiding physical contact with her and avoiding physical contact with the things that she touched. I can't imagine the shame and the disgrace that she must have felt and the shame that, they, that, 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 that her family had regarding her. She would have been rejected, isolated. People would have avoided her at, at all costs and, and possibly even considered her cursed by God. I mean, she's been suffering for 12 years. No one's been able to help her. This surely must be a curse from God. And furthermore, it meant that she could not participate in temple worship because while you're in an unclean state, you are forbidden to participate in temple worship, forbidden to go to the temple to offer up sacrifices, forbidden to go and celebrate the feasts and festivals at the temple, forbidden to go and raise your voice with the rest of the, the people of Israel in praise to God at the temple. She must have felt as though she was utterly cut off, cut off from God himself, cursed, unclean, and unable to worship God. Well, Mark records for us that as Jesus proceeds through the crowd on the way to the house of Jairus, he becomes aware that someone has touched him. And at that point, he, he stops, he addresses the crowd and, and the fear that grips this woman, Mark tells us. She, she's trembling with fear. I mean, here she, an unclean woman, had snuck up behind Jesus, touched the hem of his garment, she, an unclean woman, has touched this worker of miracles, this great teacher, this man who exudes holiness and godliness. What will become of her if it comes to light that she has touched him? Mark tells us she trembles with fear and she falls on her face. What's the Greek there? She falls on her face to the ground before Jesus. And to her credit, she tells Jesus everything. You can almost feel the sort of the, the crowd or holding their breath, waiting to see how is Jesus going to respond? Is he going to explode in anger because now he's unclean? But we then have that precious response of Jesus. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus doesn't condemn this woman. Instead, he restores her to a right standing before all those present. And not just before all those present, but also before God. Because she's not just restored to the physical community, she's restored to worship. Can you imagine what that moment must have felt like for her? That first time in 12 years of being able to go to the temple of the, the, the court of the woman in the temple and, and offer that first sacrifice after 12 years and, and sing that first song of praise. You kind of have a little taste. How did you feel the first time after COVID when you came back to church? How did you feel the first time we could actually sing after COVID? It was like just this great release to 12 years. How sweet that must have been to her. Well, think how this points us to the death and resurrection of Christ. See, we know we're in the same position as this woman. We are unclean. We are cut off from being able to worship God in a manner that is true and acceptable and pleasing to Him. We cannot come into God's presence. We cannot have fellowship with God. We cannot have a personal relationship with God. We bear the stain, the shame, the disgrace, the mark of our sin. And as long as that remains, we cannot come into God's presence. Outside of Christ, God stands as our God and our judge, the one who will by no means clear the guilty, who will repay us all according to our shameful deeds. And no matter how hard we try to make ourselves clean, no matter how much money we spend, no matter how many gurus we go to, we will not succeed. Our lives are stained. 
with shame. Isaiah tells us, Isaiah 64, 6, we've become all, become like one who's unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And as long as we're in that state, state, we cannot come into God's presence. And so what does Christ do? Christ at the cross takes upon himself our shame, our disgrace, our dishonor. Think again of that passage that we read from Isaiah. He was despised. He was rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. We poured all of our shame and scorn on him. Isaiah continues, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Considered him cursed by God. Deuteronomy 21, cursed is a man who is hung on a tree. If you are crucified, you're cursed. You have no hope before God if you are crucified. You're the worst of the worst. You're the cursed of the cursed. Jesus dies bearing our shame our disgrace, our dishonor as one considered cursed and cut off from God. Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then on that glorious resurrection day, Christ rises from the dead, restored, vindicated, satisfying the glory and honor of God clothed in his own glory and honor as the Holy One. And we who believe in Christ, well, what does he give to us? He gives to us that honor. He gives to us that glory. He gives us his standing before the Father. One, for me, one of the most precious of the, of the resurrection accounts is when Jesus says to Mary, I believe it's in John, where he says to Mary, he says, I'm going to my father and your father. It's one of the first times in the Gospels that Jesus actually refers to God the Father being our father in the Gospel of John. He gives us that standing that glory, that honor. He clothes us with His holiness, His righteousness, all that brings about the favor of God. And and all of that shame and all of that dishonor and all of that disgrace and that curse is gone. And in its place is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are adopted as God's children, given a place in His home and honored as his children. Jesus bears all our shame and disgrace, our dishonor and the curse. We come then to the third miracle. And again, Mark sets the scene. Chapter starts with a man rushing to Jesus, falling before him in desperation. That happens again. This time it's Jairus, a man of social standing and status, the synagogue ruler, and and he tells Jesus, my my daughter is at the the point of death. I don't think that there's anything harder than a parent, for a parent to endure than them watching their young child suffer, and even possibly watching that, that, that child's life ebb away. Jairus is desperate. He now knows that that such is the condition of his daughter, that that there is only one way she will survive, and that is if there is a miracle. That is if there is divine intervention. And Jairus' faith is admirable. He's confident Jesus can heal her. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. We're told that by Mark, that Jesus then accompanies Jairus to his home, pushing his way through the crowd. 
There is the interruption of the woman. And just as Jesus is speaking to this woman, the tragic, the terrible news comes to Jairus. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? I can only imagine that, that, that Jairus must have fell to the ground and just sobbed. But then Jesus says to him, do, do not fear, only believe. Now, I, I'm not sure how Jairus understood that statement. If he truly thought that Jesus could still save his daughter. But he perseveres and takes Jesus to his home. And when they arrive there, they arrive to this scene of weeping and wailing. It's a commotion and Jesus rebukes the crowd. What, what's all this wailing about? She's sleeping and they laugh at him in contempt. See, in our day and age, well, death is something that takes place in private. It takes place in hospitals and hospices behind closed doors. It, it, is a, it is a highly unusual thing, unless you're a medical professional, it is a highly unusual thing for you and I to see a dead person. But in this time of Jesus, before there were hospitals and hospices, death was public. Seeing dying people and seeing dead people was probably almost a daily experience. People knew what death looked like. And they knew that this little girl was dead. That's why they're laughing at Jesus. Like, Jesus, you're a fool if you think she's asleep. She's dead. It's clear. Everyone in the room can see she's dead. You're the fool if you think she's just asleep. But then the, the remarkable happens. Jesus takes the limp, lifeless hand of this girl. And says, little girl, I tell you, rise up. I love Mark's simplicity. She gets up. And she walks. We're told that those present, they, they were immediately overcome with amazement. And this is where we see the, the poverty of the English language. Because we, we struggle to express excitement really well in English. Greek does much better. It uses the word ecstasy, but it uses it twice. They were ecstatically ecstatic. Ecstasy means, it's two Greek words, it means to be outside of yourself with disbelief. It's like, what? Am I dreaming? Is this really happening? Please, someone pinch me. This is no way. This can't be true. We're told she, she's completely restored. She gets up, she walks around, and the parents are instructed, give her something to eat. Well, of course, we can see how clearly this points to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. But consider briefly, why is it in the first place that we die? Why is it that, that our lives are not so much living as they are dying? Well, a life lived outside of and apart from God in darkness under the power and the authority of evil and sin, a life lived in the shame, dishonor, disgrace, and of the curse that we bear is to die. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We die because we're sinners. Isaiah makes that clear. We've transgressed, we've trespassed, we've committed iniquities, and the consequence for that is death. It always has been. It always has been. God has never changed the consequence. But what does Jesus do? Well, at the cross, He becomes that sin, those transgressions, those trespasses, those iniquities. He takes all of them. 2 Corinthians 5.12, He becomes sin. Isaiah tells us that as a result of our sins, he's pierced, he's crushed, he's chastised, he's stricken, he's offered up as a guilt sacrifice. At the cross, Jesus is pierced, crushed, chastised, and, and struck down. Like that little girl, he's cut off 
from the land of the living, and he is assigned to a grave. And yet, on that glorious Resurrection Sunday, like that little girl, Christ rose from the dead. And as he rises from the dead, he demonstrates the wages have been paid in full. The ransom has been paid. The guilt offering has been accepted. And now those who trust in him are accounted as righteous. He takes the second part of Romans 6.23 and he makes it a reality. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, and that is possible because he rose from the dead. And the life that Jesus now gives is real, true life. Life with God, it is abundant life. Well, here then we have this trio of miracles. And they are not here by accident or coincidence. Mark wasn't just looking for material to fill a page. There is a reason, there is a purpose why he puts them in his gospel, and he puts them in his gospel because he wants us to understand who it is that Jesus is, and what it is that he is able to do for us through his life, death, and resurrection. And of course, as we come to to, to to celebrate the climax of that. Think then what that this means for us. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, think of what this means for us. Because Christ has broken the power of and the hold of sin and the evil one from our lives, well, what does that mean for us now? Well, that means for us that now we can say no to sin because it no longer has authority over us. We can say no to temptation. We can resist the devil. Sin and evil and the authority of sin and evil no longer needs to control our lives because Christ has defeated it and we can actually pursue after holiness. Because Christ's victory over sin makes that possible. It equips us. It gives us that power through His Spirit to actually be able to do it. Because Christ has taken away all of our dishonor and our disgrace, has taken away our shame and our curse and and has clothed us with His honor and His glory, we don't have to carry the weight of that shame anymore. How many of us live our lives under the immense weight of shame and of guilt, feeling as though we're unclean and unworthy, and and even though we know that that we are unworthy, that's not the state that that He redeemed us to live in. He says, you are my beloved child. You are clothed in the righteous robes of Christ. There is nothing more lovely, more pleasing, more acceptable, more desirable for me to see than to see the the, the righteousness of my beloved Son upon you. That makes you my child. You're part of my family. You bear no shame. You bear no disgrace. You bear no curse. It has been completely taken away. You have full, free constant, without any limit or restriction, personal, daily access to God in worship, in prayer, in fellowship, through His Word. There is never a moment of any day from now until the end of eternity for you as a believer where you will not have access personally, directly, immediately to God Himself. Because Christ has removed all of that which separated you from being able to do that. And in His place has clothed you with His glory, His honor, His righteousness. And because Christ has paid the wages for our sin and set us free from death, He has brought us into new, eternal life, true life. Life in His kingdom, His presence. We have a hope that goes beyond all other hopes. We no longer live to die. We live to live. We live to then live. 
in His presence. Our lives have a trajectory, they have a hope, they have a future, they have an end that nobody else in the world has. Everything else that this world puts its hope in will fail. No matter what it is, it will fail. But our hope is unfailing and is eternal because it is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have life. And therefore, we can endure through trial, through difficulty. We can even have hope when we receive a terminal diagnosis. Why? Because it's not the end. Paul tells us, Romans 8, 11, the same power which raised Christ from the dead is already at work in us and will bring us into the resurrection life in God's eternal kingdom. Because of Easter, we who hope in Christ are free beyond what we can fathom. Free from the authority of sin, evil, and the evil one. Free from guilt, shame, dishonor, and curse. Free from sin. The penalty no longer applies. Free from death, and in its place is life. Abundant, joy-filled, eternal life. Oh, how we should, how we should to meditate on this constantly. And let these realities of what Christ has accomplished be the lens through which we constantly see our lives every single day. The way we react or think through things that happen or, or the way that we make decisions or the way that we, we think about our future and our lives and our family. Because there is nothing greater that will happen in your life than that which Christ has worked. And nothing that will change your life more than what Christ has changed it at the cross. And so my challenge to you this, this coming week as we have these days to, to build up to Easter, let us meditate on that which Christ has done for us at the cross. So that when we come together again on Friday and on Sunday, we are, we are filled with a song of praise and joy, celebrating, rejoicing in that which Christ has done for us. And finally, it would be remiss of me if I closed without challenging those present here this morning who do not believe in Jesus, who have not taken hold of this gift of salvation that he offers. Today, you are like that man, that woman, and that little girl. You are still under the power and the hold of of sin, evil, and the evil one. You are still in the dishonor and the disgrace and the shame of your sin against God, and the penalty of that will be death and the judgment of God. That much is absolutely true. Yet, you have the same hope that that man and that woman, and that little girl had. Because Christ has come. And just as he set them free, so he now offers that same opportunity to you today. He is willing to set you free from your sin, from your shame, and from its eternal consequences. And all you need to do is do exactly what that, that man and that woman and that little girl did. That is come to Jesus and to ask for his mercy. And he will have mercy. And so my challenge to you today is to take hold of the life that Jesus came to give you. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, what can we say to such a glorious Savior and a glorious salvation? Thank you that it is a complete salvation. Nothing is lacking from it. So help us to, to meditate upon that which Christ has done for us. 
to rejoice in it and allow it to, to strengthen our faith and to spur us on in godliness and holiness, to inspire us to worship in song and through our lives, and to constantly rejoice in the life that you have given us. I thank you that you are, Lord Jesus Christ, a complete Savior. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to close by standing together and singing a, a wonderful resurrection hymn. See what a morning, gloriously bright, with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Let's stand together and sing with joy. <laughs> who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>